So um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you guys kind of for hanging today um, and taking the time out of your day. I want to take a moment to allow you guys to introduce yourself in a second. Um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you guys the reins. Um, first and foremost, I am a white male living in our country right now. And I just want to be a voice to listen to everything that you guys have to say and use the platform that we have to allow other people to understand what's going on in the world and what better place to do it than right here. So um, thank you guys again for doing this. Um, as you know, I'm Chase. Um, and I'll let you guys take a second to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm April Smith and I'm from Virginia. Hi, April. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Grant. I am from Sherman Oaks, California. I'm Kayla. I'm from <clears throat> I'm from Danville, California. And then we have Tia. I'll go. Uh, my name is Tia. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Chief Clinical Operations Officer of the Trevor Project. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, Tia, do you mind taking a second and just kind of let us know a little bit about the Trevor Project? Sure. So um, the Trevor Project is the largest LGBTQ suicide prevention organization in the country, probably the world. Um, and we offer 24-7 crisis services for LGBTQ youth in crisis. Um, and they call us, they chat, or they text us um, when they are struggling. Um, not everybody calls us in crisis. Some people are just questioning or some people are having problems with their parents, but we are here 24-7 for them. That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great job, <laughs> to say the least. I don't like it. It's really cool. Yeah. So, and then I believe... All of you guys are a part of Bring Change to Mind, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, so do you guys want to take a second and just kind of dive into what that's been for you and how that experience has been and, and you know, your two cents on Bring Change to Mind? Maybe. Correct. do you want to go? <laughs> sure, yeah. So Bring Change to Mind, I got involved with Bring Change to Mind um, about two years ago. I'm actually a part of another organization called Teen Line, which is a teen-to-teen uh, crisis um, and uh, teen to teen helpline. And so um, they uh, helped me become aware of Bring Change to Mind because I want to start a mental health club at my school. And basically Bring Change to Mind provides the resources and the support in the community for teens like myself to create mental health clubs, conversations, programs within their high school. Um, and so I've been involved for the past two years and um, I started the club towards the end of my sophomore year um, and we've been going strong um, and I actually graduated this year. So the club is going to continue at my school after I leave, which is something that I'm really excited about. That's super cool. Well, thank you for all your hard work. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, like I, I kind of mentioned earlier, I just really want to mediate and give you guys a space to kind of talk about um everything under the sun and then most importantly kind of what's going on in the climate of the world right now and especially what we're living through um and i think one of the main topics that i think we can all relate on is uh the mental health space and how in the lgbtq community how that's been for you guys through um this whole covid 19 experience and and how that's been and how you guys are actually feeling not you know, the let's slap a smile on and talk about it, you know, with that way. Like, how, how are you guys? How's, how's everything going? It's, it's difficult, right? I mean, I think, I don't think, it's not easy being, you know, part of the LGBTQ plus community by itself, but when you add in, external pressures and increased attention and it, it gets very stressful sometimes and and I think visibility is a amazing thing and it's great to have all kinds of voices but at the same time it is it is a point where we feel kind of vulnerable um, sometimes and, and and we feel um, 
you know, especially with with COVID and then and then Black Lives Matter and just 2020. I think for anyone, 2020 has been a crazy six month. It's like 10 years and six months. Um, but it's also really difficult for people who are gay, who are trans. Um, for example, during during uh, a lot of the lockdowns, we were trapped in, in in our homes. And for a lot of us, that was extremely destructive, especially for those that did not have supportive supportive uh, family members. And and um, um, but with the whole um, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think. I mean, I'm I'm I am not black, but um, uh, as someone that is a person of color, it feels very liberating in a sense to to finally have kind of a moment for people that have been marginalized for 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 hundreds of years, and and to finally see a system that has that is broken for so many of our Americans. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that. You guys want to add anything? Your experiences? I think um, playing off of April, it is hard in this circumstance with COVID and like being at home for people who aren't accepted by their families and have chosen families that they'd rather be with. And I think the hardest thing over the past couple months, like I'm very lucky to have supportive parents, but it took a long time. It took a lot of education. Uh, it took a lot of open conversation, but for people like, you know, my girlfriend is in a very abusive situation with her coming out. And, you know, it's hard in these circumstances when we're not able to be there for her as much. And she has to be in these spaces where uh, she's not accepted. And that's where like, you know, organizations like the Trevor Project come in, like when in crisis or when feeling down or even just having questions, like being able to chat with somebody or call somebody like, you know, that's, that's where the change is made is when we're able to reach out to people and to, to have open conversations like this. Yeah, kind of just to add on to that, I think, you know, I think what's really great about you, Chase, using your platform to help um, teens and anyone, any LGBTQ youth um, to become aware of organizations like the Trevor Project, because I think during this time when we're not in school and, and we're not able to um, see people that maybe know of these organizations, um, it can feel very isolating and alone. I know just for myself, um, being gay, um, especially when I wasn't out, um, I felt extremely alone. And, um, and that wasn't necessarily because of my parents or because of anyone. It was just solely because I believed that I didn't, you know, belong in, in a community like the LGBTQ plus community that is so welcoming and um, so open. And so to add on top of that being in, you know, an actual physical isolation, um, it only exacerbates those emotions and those feelings of loneliness. And so, you know, when, you, because we're all, you know, kind of ingrained in this world of social media, I think it's so important that, um, teens have access to these resources like the Trevor Project that are really there for us. Right. How about you, Tia? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because hearing what the, what folks are saying on this conversation is exactly what we hear on the lines, which is, um, you know, COVID pushed people um, into isolation, isolating from their sort of peers who at school, the GSAs, where they were getting support. And then um, I think that there was so much messaging around make use of this time initially, like look at all this free time and where people were feeling a lot of grief mm -hmm. around being ripped away from their life. And, uh, you know, I think about like the young people who go to college and they're like, thank goodness I'm escaping my house and now I'm trapped in the house with, uh, you know, family members who aren't accepting, I'm being forced to go to church, I'm, you know, whatever the thing. And I think it's been really, it was devastating. And then with the, you know, um, the protests um, on top of it, you know, sort of George, George Floyd was this like, um, this this trigger that happened. And then I, I have to say that our, our black and brown LGBTQ youth have been utterly devastated um, and feeling really unsafe walking around their neighborhoods, potentially feeling a lot of grief and rage. And so 
um, it's been really tough because we know that black and brown youth are, um, you know, have far less access to mental health care. We know that black and brown youth between the ages of five and 12 are twice as likely to um, complete suicide um, than their same, uh, same peers, uh, white peers. And so uh, there is, there's so much going on for our youth that uh, it's been, it's been, it's been overwhelming. And on top of that, I am always in awe of their grace and their resiliency. And so when I think about the young people on this, this, this conversation, the fact that folks can talk about it in such a um, thoughtful manner, I'm just constantly in awe of, of the young people. So, so it's like a combination, which I'm so impressed with their ability to manage and so many uh, emotions that can be overwhelming in a way that I think a lot of adults would not be able to. Absolutely, yeah. And on that note, are you guys finding other ways? I mean, Tia, you kind of touched on it a second ago um, with how it started out as us assuming we had all this free time to work on ourselves and be present with ourselves in, in all of these ways that I think in society prior to this, we're, we're hoping that we could just have a week of of freedom to be able to sit and be present with ourselves. Now that we're going into, what is it, month four, month five of, you know, isolation, how are you guys managing? Like, are you taking advantage of some of these tools like Zoom to stay in touch with friends and, and community members as well? Or, or has it been something that over time you've seen sort of slowly decrease or what has it been for you guys? It's definitely not easy. That's, yeah. that's definitely true. Um, for example, um, uh, I live in a family that um, like on the outside, they're very supportive of LGBTQ plus people. Um, they wouldn't mind if it was anyone else, but when it's actually their child, um, it's a little bit of a different story. And so for example, at home, um, um, my gender identity isn't uh, affirmed um, uh, my right pronouns or my right names are not used. Um, and that's something that I struggle with because, um, you know, on externally, I have to put up with it, but internally it's, it's my identity being, being crushed every single time the wrong name is used, the wrong pronouns are used. And it, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, Obviously, I can I can talk online and and I can try to utilize online resources, but it's definitely not the same as having someone that can that can just give you a hug when you when you're feeling like there's nothing else that you can do or 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 talking to people, um, for example, mental health professionals. Um, um, I I go to a therapist and a psychologist. Psych psychiatrist when I can, but um, obviously during the pandemic, that's not something that I was able to do. And, um, you know, like school counselors are not something I can utilize when I'm not in school. So, so it's definitely been difficult. And I think that's a similar experience to a lot of LGBTQ plus youth in this country. Absolutely. I I, first of all, I just want to thank you, April, for being so open and honest about what you just shared, because, you know, as a cis white um, man, I definitely recognize my privilege, um, not even just, you know, in, in the outside world, but also within the gay community. I think, you know, the LGBTQ plus community, because I think there is, you know, unfortunately, um, though you know, LG, the LGBTQ plus community is very open and inclusive. There are parts of it that aren't. And frankly, um, you know, my privilege within the community, I mean, being able to go to LA Pride or, or any of these Pride events and be able to see myself, but not necessarily, you know, my friend who's trans be able to see themselves um, is something that, you know, is an issue that needs to be addressed within our community. And I think especially, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, having brown and black, you know, queer voices heard during this time is so important when, you know, black trans women are being killed 
um, and nothing's being done about it. And so, you know, kind of going back to your question, Chase, about, you know, dealing with this isolation. And um, I think there is this attitude within our society of, you know, making the most of every situation and uh, continuing to work and work and work. But, you know, as you said, Tia, um, this is a moment of grief and loss for a lot of us. Um, you know, as a senior in high school, I mean, obviously my grief isn't as big as, you know, somebody who's grieving the death of a family member, um, whether from COVID or police brutality, but, you know, we're all dealing with some sort of grief and loss at this moment. And so not addressing that and instead focusing on, okay, well, let me do this activity. Let me work out and do this, you know, is kind of negating the fact that we're all grieving during this time. So I think that's something that I've found really helpful is addressing the issue as a grief and loss issue and not just, you know, you know, coping with isolation kind of thing. Cool. Um, I, I kind of want to transition into um, the Black Lives Matter movement. As we've seen, this has been a monumental moment in not just our you know, existence, but now moving into the education of things that, you know, we weren't taught in our normal school system. I mean, I had a beautiful conversation earlier today with, you know, a friend of mine and watching some of these statues come down around the country and talking about this in an open platform now and looking back at my experience at your age and saying, why was I never informed of, of these pieces? I mean, I'm on the East Coast right now in Wilmington, North Carolina, to be specific, and I don't know if you guys have seen the news, but there's the horrific news about the three cops that just came out and said some horrible, horrible things over their police radio. Um, and then overnight, uh, they took down a Confederate statue here in Wilmington, as well as we shoot in Charleston. We do our entire show in Charleston. There's monuments um, based on, uh, you know, Confederate soldiers who had slaughtered, you know, Black people during this time period to try to save whatever was going on. I don't want to be too off topic on the story, but um, going kind of redirecting what I was saying, um, how, how are you guys doing during this period? Like, are you activating your platforms? Um, because I've had a lot of people reaching out to me who are concerned because there is some people who don't know how to talk about these things. So just wanted to ask you guys, what are your thoughts on everything going on right now? And what are you guys doing to sort of spread awareness during this time period? You know, um, I think this is a time to uplift and amplify voices that have been traditionally marginalized, especially um, black and brown Americans. And mm -hmm. to me, I feel like the definition of being an ally has really changed in the past couple of months. I think to be an ally, you know, I think allyship has transitioned from a noun to an action verb. It's transition, it's transition, transition from a thing you can be to a thing you can do. So to be an ally, you have to actually work for the betterment of the community, not just before a community. You have to actively be an ally and, and uplift voices, provide resources, donate, advocate. And, and it's just something that I think is a very important advancement in, in allyship for, for all around the country, not just for black and brown Americans. I think that's um, incredibly important. And I think there's, there's two sides in, in having change in, in this society. I think there's uh, change through uh, changing societal attitudes and then change through policy. And I think the two are very um, interlocked um, and move um, and similar, but uh, at different rates. And I think it's important that I think what's been so effective about this movement is that we're attacking it from both sides. And, and, and I, I think that's just an 
incredibly inspiring for all all vulnerable communities around America and and it, it makes me hopeful for a for a better future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Chase, can I jump in? Because I just want to give April some snaps because sure. I agree with you so so strongly. I agree with I love the way that you framed that. And one of the things that we were we've been seeing is like there's like been a journey over the last month or so. See, you know, I don't even I actually have no sense of time. I don't know about y'all, but I don't even know. I'm not sure what day it is. What's going on? Anyway, so but what I've seen is initially there was so much rage. I think especially me as a as a black woman, a lot of this woman a lot of rage around um sort of like this has been going on you know this is the united states was built on what, what's about on slavery right you know it was built on free labor um and sort of like this has just been this last month has been like the manifestation of you know 400 years of mistreatment and i i have been and i'm going to use april as an example um so impressed by the younger generation as I saw something on 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 uh, Instagram um, and it was like this woman dancing and, and she was like you've done effed with the wrong generation in this dance and I was like I was like yes young people y'all are doing it in a way that no other generation has done so like that's why I've been so like uh, in awe and amazed by the change that has been wrought by the youth and just thinking about how you all are, are organizing in a completely different way. And so, you know, I think allyship is now a verb and I think that folks are really getting it. So I appreciate April, your framing around. Yeah, that was very eloquently put. Like I, honestly, there was a moment where I like looked down on my arms and I had goosebumps. I was like, yes, like keep going. So thank you for that. Um, Okay, so Tia, I think maybe now would be um, a cool place to sort of talk about um, the Supreme Court's recent ruling. Um, and I'll give you guys a floor again. You know, I'm here to, to kind of let you guys talk. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's, it's important to kind of discuss this. This is a big moment. Well, before you kick it to me, do, all, do you mind kicking it to, to the youth? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't hear them first. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> well, um, I think with the most recent ruling, uh, I think we're talking about the discrimination laws and correct, like that's what we're going at. Um, I think it's, again, like what April said, like talking about the policy side of it and the social aspects of like the activism I think in within like the policy standpoints of like actually going through the Supreme Court I think it was a huge ruling considering like everything going on right now and the climate of the world and also like during Pride Month I think that it's really important that you know these policies are passed and that they are you know like established as like it is illegal to discriminate against you know LGBTQ people and I think that with everything going on in the world right now, um, it was definitely, it's definitely a start, but there's still more to be done. Um, I think especially on the social movement of like, just like talking to people who don't really understand LGBTQ plus folks and, you know, um, also just like looking into more states that are, you know, not as accepting and like, it starts with action. It starts with stories and you know, like, just as we are doing now, talking, talking about it, and, you know, creating this dialogue with people who possibly, like, don't really understand LGBTQ plus folks or anything like that, and just having this dialogue is the most important part um, to, like, a catalyst of acceptance and change. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, and, and I think during this time, um, it's definitely been eye-opening to see, um, you know, the change that the Supreme Court um, made recently, obviously with the um, anti-discrimination ruling, um, coming so shortly after um, uh, the Trump administration's uh, de decision to roll back um, uh, transgender um, 
rights uh, in, in involved uh, with uh, healthcare. And right. so um, especially having that um, be announced on uh, the anniversary of the Pulse shooting. Um, and so that's something that I think as a queer person myself has been very frustrating because it feels like um, people just aren't, you know, aware of these things. Um, and, you know, it, it just baffled me that something like that could happen on a day that um, is filled with so much grief and so much, um, you know, memoriam for these people that, um, that lost their lives. And so I think, you know, again, going back to what April said about, you know, being an ally um, and, uh, you know, being able to use your platform to uh, make aware of these things that, you know, some people aren't aware. I mean, I, I had so many friends that were like, wait, it was, it wasn't illegal to discriminate against uh, LGBTQ people. And the truth of the matter is that is, it, it was that way for an extremely long time. And, you know, conversion therapy is still legal in more than half of um, the United States. And so it's those things that you think, oh, we've come so far and yet we haven't. And people aren't angry enough about it um, that are in the position of being an ally. And so I think with this Black Lives Matter movement, it's really come to light who's actually on our side, who's actually on the side of LGBTQ um, people, who's on the side of Black and Brown lives, who's on the side of those who are being oppressed and those who are minorities. And so I think what's really great about this movement and and the fact that, you know, the gay rights movement, um, that came out of the civil rights movement. And so, you know, LGBTQ rights wouldn't be where they are without Black lives, without Black trans people. And so, you know, I think it's so important within our community to address that and to um, be aware that, you know, this Black Lives Matter movement, it involves us. It is up to us to be allies to um, black and brown lives. And if I can interject just a little bit, um, obviously when the Supreme Court decided that um, under Title VII that uh, employers could not discriminate against employees based on, uh, based on being gay or transgender because of the uh, sex clause under the uh, Civil Rights Act, that was a massive victory and it was a day of celebration, except that it was only a day of celebration because we can celebrate for one day, but then we have to get right back to work because, you know, for example, yes, we have Title VII now, but how about Title IX that affects people in education? Or, or, or even though the Supreme Court ruled, ruled uh, in that way, how is it going to be enforced? Because again, the executive, the White House is in charge of enforcing Supreme Court uh, cases. So, so for example, how is the Trump administration going to enforce this? And, and it just becomes, you know, I think it's difficult because you want to celebrate, you want to have one day where you can say, okay, we finally got something, but but there's just so much more and it keeps piling on and on. And, and I think it just shows how much we still have left to fight for as a community, as, as Americans and, and, and as, a, as humans. I mean, I think acceptance has come a long way, but we have so much more. I, it's, it's just beginning. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just, it's, Thank you guys for speaking on these things. I mean, it's it's a really beautiful thing to see the youth of the world here. You mentioned it, like the the bravery, the honesty, the vulnerability that you guys are are willing to take into your hands and just be so proactive about these things. Is, I mean, I look back to when I was in high school and I was just so uninformed with what was going on in you know in the political world. And to hear you guys talk so eloquently about these things is such a great thing to see, especially now with everything going on in the world. And TIC, I see you shaking your head because it's, this is the change that we, not only we need, but you guys are implementing. And your voices are so strong on so many different levels. 
and that you guys know that and that you're activating it is making it that much more exciting for me as somebody who's trying to continue to learn and continue to educate myself on a lot of these topics. So again, thank you guys so much for, you know, speaking out in this capacity. Um, and Tia, did you want to kind of add anything to that a little bit? I mean, I was playing Nintendo. That's what I was <laughs> doing at that same age. Sure. So I feel like I just feel so impressed and, you know, I just excited to see what the folks on this call end up doing. Um, I don't know. I, I'm feeling a lot of hope because I think change is coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Can I, kinda... if I say two things? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, go for it. Oh, I just wanted to say um, just in regards to the Trevor project, um, that is an organization, you know, if, if anyone is watching this, that um, I myself have uh, contacted multiple times and um, have used as, um, you know, a support system for me when I didn't think I had a support system. And so if anybody is watching this and is afraid to reach out to anyone, the Trevor Project is where you should be reaching out um, because it's impacted my life. Um, and then the second thing that I just wanted to say, just because, you know, I know Chase, you're in the entertainment industry. And I think that's one thing that I've definitely um, have taken away from this, you know, being in isolation and, and, and watching shows and, and, and TV shows and, and movies and stuff is um, representation, I think is something that is so important. Um, I just got done watching Pose, which is um, a show uh, on, I don't know the exact channel, but I've been watching it on Netflix. And um, it is primarily uh, all actual trans women that are playing these trans characters and they're all black, brown, they're all people of color. And I think that's what's so important right now is, you know, in the entertainment industry, seeing representation because representation is the key to visibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I hope, you know, can change out of all the things that are going on in the world is, is that we, we get to see more actual gay and lesbian actors, actual trans actors playing these trans roles. Um, I don't know why I needed to share that, but I just no, I felt no, like it needed to be said. I've, I've you know, met Janet Mock, who is very involved with the Pose world um, and talk about a wonderful human being and allowing representation on a platform like that. and to watch that show turn into what it has turned into. It's been quite an awesome thing. Not only that, it's incredibly fun to watch too. So to oh, watch yeah. all of the representation and then storytelling as well. It's like, why not? Why, why aren't we continuing to advocate for more representation across the board? So thank you for saying that. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so now I want to, I want to talk to you guys about your experiences. So maybe we can go kind of one by one. Um, and if you guys are okay with sharing it, that'd be awesome. If not, please don't ever hesitate to say like, this is an uncomfortable thing for me. Um, but I just, if you're okay with it, I'd love to know how you guys came out and what was your, what's your story? Um, I think for me, I had a very unique situation because, um, you know, I had been struggling and like, again, like what Grant said, like, I have reached out to the Trevor Project multiple times in my life. Uh, and during my sophomore year, when I was like, especially struggling, I think, not only with mental health, but also like identity, I ended up having a really bad falling out in school, dropped out of high school, you know, um, I attempted suicide, ended up in the hospital, and I ended up going to a residential. And that was like, kind of the catalyst for me that was like, okay, like, I want to, like, work out my internalized homophobia. I want to write about it. I want to talk about it. And I was really lucky to be able to be in a very safe space and like in a residential treatment to be able to come out to my parents and then come out to my siblings. And then right out of residential, when I got back um, home, it was very much like, not really like, a, like an announcing coming out, but just like, this is who I am. And this is who I'm going to be. And, and I was very, very lucky to be accepted by my family with open arms. Um, you know, having other gay people in my family, but also just, I think 
the most important thing for me was just coming out to myself. And it sounds cheesy, but, you know, having grown up with so much internalized homophobia of like, there will be a man who will come and save you and love you and, and you're supposed to look like this and you're supposed to be womanly and you're supposed to follow these gender identities, you know, to, to just have that time in my life, like after coming out of such a bad mental health episode, um, to come out and be like, yeah, like this is okay. And this is who I want to be. And this is, this is the life I want to live. And, you know, focusing on my recovery, but also my identity and mental health and being part of the LGBTQ plus is it's intertwined. It's interwoven. It's, it's definitely a part of my recovery. And instead of shunning it and pushing it away, I'm very lucky to be able to be in a place now where I say, I would say like, I wouldn't want to be any other way. And um, I know a lot of people don't really get as lucky as I did with my experience. Um, it, d it doesn't mean it's not hard, doesn't mean it's not, you know, I don't face struggles, but um, I definitely think that like, because I had such a good experience, I wanna be there for people who don't. And I wanna be there for people who, who struggle. And, you know, I wanna be a chosen family to somebody. That's beautiful, thank you for sharing that. Grant, did you want to go or April, do you want to go? I can go, yeah. Yeah, um, go yeah so I mean, for me, um, I do I, I do want to say that, you know, I am very fortunate to have um, a very accepting and supportive family. Um, and so that made my coming out process a lot easier than, um, you know, the majority of um, LGBTQ plus teens um, around the world. Um, but, you know, I think for me, it, again, it was never really that big of an issue for the people around me, but it was an issue that I had with myself. And that was something that I definitely struggled with because growing up, I think it, for me, it was okay for anybody else to be gay, to be queer. Um, I, mean, I don't even think I knew that queer was a term at the time. Um, but it wasn't okay for me. And I think that's something that um, I still struggle with to this day is, is um, kind of the whole um, toxic masculinity surrounding um, being a gay man or even just a straight man who, you know, likes things that are, are stereotypically feminine. Um, and so I think that was something that I struggled with. Um, I remember the first couple of times that I actually came out to close friends, I, I believe I was um, 13 or 14, um, those first few times I couldn't even say the word gay because um, it was just something that I felt so much shame over, even though the people around me were so accepting, it still, it couldn't click in my mind that I could, that this was me, that um, I, I just felt so much shame about it. I felt like you know, I didn't live up to this societal standard of being a man if I was gay. And so, um, again, that's something that I still struggle with to this day and I think is still prevalent within the gay community itself is, is, is seeing people that are still internally homophobic um, because of the trauma that they experienced when they were younger. Um, and so I think, you know, as I've been able to come into my own, I remember the first time that I came out to my parents, my mom actually asked me. Um, and again, it was something that I, I, I couldn't even say the words I'm gay because there was just so much shame and stigma surrounding it um, within myself. And so, you know, once I was able to graduate middle school and, and go into high school and kind of have this fresh slate, um, I just decided that I was going to be honest about it because at the end of the day, I was tired of living uh, my own internal shame. Um, and, and so going forward, I was able to, you know, be somebody who was out and open about being gay. And while it did feel very isolating at times because I was going to a Catholic school where I was really the only openly gay student at my school, it also, helped me see that, you know, I could make a change. Um, and so I fought for getting a GSA at our school. And, and while we aren't able to call it a GSA, um, we still have that club available for LGBTQ plus students in this Catholic school environment. And so I think that's something that 
um, you know, that's why I wouldn't trade being gay for anything because, you know, it's made me the fighter that I am. It's made me the person um, that I am today. And so I just hope that, you know, as I move forward, if, if I've, I've been able to help anybody along the way, I think that's what makes it all worth it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my story with coming out. Um, but yeah. Wow, that's crazy to think in a, in a Catholic school you made that type of an impact. Yeah, it was, I, I'm, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool. Amazing. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Super cool. April. Um, if I can be a little bit vulnerable right now, um, I, I went to an all boys school for the longest time and it was a very difficult for me, you know, my identity being invalidated every single day that I step into school and I finally was able to change to a different high school when I was a freshman and I, I didn't even know what transgender meant or I've never even heard of it until high school and and when I first heard I was like could, could this be me you know all my life I had I had felt I I felt that I was a girl, but it just, it just felt so weird. It was like, but how is it possible that this is me? And, and, you know, I think the most important coming out, at least for me, um, was to my parents. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't do it in front of their faces. I was just too scared. And and looking back retroactively, I, I wish I told them from face to face, but I, I told them through text and it was something that I felt comfortable at that time. And they they did not take it well. And my my mother who was who is Japanese, um, especially um, kind of had a little bit of a different reaction, not only because being a mother, but also from cultural differences. And, and I think it was hard for her to, to think of what she thought was her little baby boy for the longest time was, was not her baby boy. And, and, um, and, you know, for months before I was, I was struggling with depression and anxiety and, and I finally got the courage to come out and it just, it didn't go the way I wanted it to. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, I hope I can add a trigger warning right here, but, um, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just thought, I thought, what am I doing? And, and I, I, I took a handful of pills and, and, and then I went back to bed and, you know, and, but then I woke up next morning and I'm like, wow, I feel fine. So, so I go to school and then um, I have a seizure in the middle of class and, and I go to hospital and just, and, and just kind of like how Kayla said that just, it was a moment where I, I was, I, I, I not that woke me up, but I, I felt once you face mortality, there's a different attitude that comes over you and, and after that, I made a, with the help of, of a psychiatric hospital and um, a psychiatrist and, and my therapist, you know, and, and my parents all as a team, we kind of had to make a plan. We had to, we had to say that, okay, this is not working. We have to change. And although I don't live in a household where it's all accepting and all amazing. At least I'm not antagonized and and at least I can live in my house without worrying of of danger 
and and at least I can depend on my parents to feed me and give me shelter. And sometimes that's all you can ask for. And you know, my I think everyone's journey is different and that's what makes coming out special. And and I just I just hope that everyone knows that that there is someone there for them. I am I am there for you. You know, I you know, if 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 you're watching this, I am here for you. And you know, Chase is here for you and Grant is here for you and Kayla is here for you. And there are so, so many people that are here for you. Bring Change in Mind is here for you. And and I I just I just hope that everyone knows that there is always a way, always someone that will be here for you. And and I would be happy to be that person, and and a lot of people would be. So, thank you for sharing your story. Um, yeah. So the wow. Um, I I have one more question for you guys, and then I'll let you go. Um, what in your ideal future? You know, what would you envision for the conversations and how you want them to change? Uh, around mental health as well as the LGBTQ plus community? Like, what would you guys want to see? What are one or two things that you could think of off the top of your head that are major changes you'd want to see? I think just having conversations like this, like, you know, with somebody who, you know, you know, and, and that's something that I, I really appreciate um, from you, Chase, is, is being so, you know, inquisitive and, and wanting to learn about us and our stories and where we came from and, and our, our feelings because you know at the end of the day we're all human we're all experiencing the same emotions uh, we experience them in different situations um, but you know we can all relate to emotions and I think that's something that has been helpful for me in you know telling my own story and and my struggles with you know, mental health and mental illness, um, you know, through Bring Change to Mind and through Teen Line is, is having these people that are there to listen and are there to really hear out um, your story and, and not try and interject and say, oh, well, at least it wasn't this or at least it wasn't that. No, just listening and validating somebody. Um, I think, you know, in the future, that's something that I would really love to see is, is having more of these spaces where we're able to intermingle, intermingle, intermingle with um, both, you know, straight people and uh, trans people and bi people and gay people and, and just, you know, people of all different walks of life and feel open and comfortable to talk about these things. And it's not this dream that will never happen. Like, this is just proof that these spaces can exist, um, even if they're over the computer. We'll have to do it in person someday. I promise yes. you guys. Thank you for that. Of course. Um, I just wanted to say, April, my God, I'm giving you the biggest virtual hug right now. You literally made me cry. Um, but as someone who also, like, as you said, like, has faced that more, like, the mortality aspect of it and, like, just going forward with life, um, I commend you. I am here for you and I'm here for anybody watching this and I think you're an amazing human being as well as Grant as well as Chase being able to Chase being able to use your platform for conversations like this is is you know the the first step to actually having conversations like this and you know as a writer as somebody who goes on stages and performs like I I think that just like what I want to see is open dialogue and also just normalizing the conversation of mental health, breaking the stigma as Bring Change to Mind does uh, in high schools and beyond. And also just like with LGBTQ plus representation, I mean, for it to just be as it is and not just like, cause every time like a gay character comes out in a show or there's a trans character or anything like that, it's huge to us and we always acknowledge it. But one day I'd like to see that we don't have to come out, that it's just part of life. It's just part of the way we are because all of us are different. All of us come from different walks of life. And I think that it's important for that representation to be instilled in media and 
it is now like there are you know even cartoons with gay characters and trans characters or like the last of us 2 just came out and that features a gay love story and a trans main character it's you know these are the things that we will keep going and and it will bring out the best in us and you know representation matters because that's what's going to normalize the conversation that's what's going to normalize lgbtq people in places where you know there aren't many of us that are out and i think that's just you know we're on the right track definitely yeah absolutely april i think if we if we bring it down to the basics the thing we want is equality no more no less we just want to be treated the same as as everyone else is and i think that's true for all minorities and and all vulnerable communities we just want to be treated equal and you know i think the fact that we have to fight for that is a tragedy but it's also something that I can be proud of that I am contributing, that we are contributing towards a fight for a better America, for a better world, for, for a more empathetic and understanding society. And I am really proud of that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you guys. Uh, this has been uh, super special to me. Um, Grant, you said something earlier about Pulse, um, and I actually wear this every day, and this is the coordinates to Pulse nightclub because um, I grew up right around the corner from Pulse. Um, so when you you said that, it was like super ironic because I happened to be in Orlando where I grew up, and the day I got there was the day of the anniversary, and I actually ran into um, uh, a friend from high school, and I didn't know that they were transgender and she had changed her pronoun to she and uh, we talked for a while and she was like you probably remember me as a he from high school but now i'm a she and it's nice to see you know a straight white man on his own in a place like this and i didn't go for the media i didn't go for any of that it was just you know something in my heart told me to go so um that was kind of a, a cool connection that i i didn't think some people would pick up on especially in this time but with that being said thank you guys so much uh, for your time. Thank you to the Trevor Project. Thank you to Bring Change to Mind for setting this up. And most importantly, to you three. Um, you guys are awesome. This has been so great just to have a space for you guys to be able to share your stories and yourself and allow the world to see you for who you are internally and let that shine. Um, so thank you guys again for, for being so brave, being vulnerable, especially during such a crazy time period. Um, I appreciate you guys willing to, to talk about this during a time period where all of our mental health is a little bit on edge and our sanity is, is definitely been rocked with everything going on in the world. So um, again, I feel like I'm a, a broken record player say, saying it, but thank you. Thank you for, for teaching me things that I didn't know and, and having a conversation with me that um, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for. So um, yeah hope you guys enjoyed this this little time and um again shoot me a message on instagram i want to stay in touch with you guys and uh, hopefully we'll have this up on my page soon thank you so, thank much, you so much thank you so much thank you. you guys are awesome have a good one you Goodbye. too